Welcome to the twelfth presentation in the series where we're looking at the book of Ezekiel. Insights from Ezekiel. I've entitled this Empires and God's Purposes. Let's just reflect back where we've been in the previous presentation. In the previous presentation and in this presentation we're looking at chapters 25 to 32 of the book. Ezekiel is speaking to exiles, drawn from the leadership classes who'd been deported in 597 BC. They saw themselves as a superior group. They were God's chosen people, and they looked down on neighboring people groups. This section looks at these neighboring people groups. They were all enemies of Judah, the people of God. They were all seeking her downfall. And what happened to them is related to the future of Judah, the people of God. A central theme runs, runs right throughout this section. God rules the affairs of all people groups. And God deals with everyone with total fairness. Many of these people groups were attacking the people of God and had attacked the people of God over the centuries. They will face the consequences for their actions in due time. It's a fact of history that these people groups were absorbed, conquered or replaced. The people of God went on intact. They survived as an entity. But they had responsibilities, as do we today. We've got to put our house in order. The people of Judah had suffered horrendously because they'd thumbed their nose at God, pushed him to the sidelines and decided to run things their own way for their own selfish benefit. And their nation had fallen apart. The last section we looked at, five people groups. Ammon was spared by Nebuchadnezzar, who chose to destroy Judah first, but it was later overrun by desert tribes. It disappeared from history. Moab just refused to recognize the people of God as anything special at all. It disappeared from history. Edom, the kingdom to the south, persistent skirmishes between Judah and Israel previously. The people there betrayed the Israelites when they were fleeing the Babylonians. The land was overrun and conquered. They disappeared from history. The Philistines tried to destroy the Israelite nation. The people group were overrun, absorbed, disappeared from history. Tyre and the area around it was the trading center for the Phoenician peoples, controlling the whole of the end of the Mediterranean Sea. Wealthy, arrogant, self-sufficient, Nebuchadnezzar waged a 13-year campaign against them. Weakened them, destroyed them, brought them to submission. Finally, Alexander the Great wiped them out. They disappeared from history. Now let's move on and let's look at the map again. You can see Ammon, Moab, Edom, Sidon, Tyre in the north. Sidon kind of took over from Tyre when Tyre had been brought to heel. And the land of Philistia with the Egyptian empire to the south. Now we're going to look at the end of chapter 28. And it's right in the middle of this section. But it makes sense of the whole section. After that we're going to turn to the Egyptian Empire and then look at empires in general. So let's focus on this, this key area which seems a little strange on first reading. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, set your face against Sidon. Prophesy against her and say, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I am against you, Sidon, and among you I will display my glory. You will know that I am the Lord when I inflict punishment on in you, and within you I am proved to be holy. 
I will send a plague upon you and make blood flow in your streets. The slain will fall within you, and the sword against you on every side. Then you will know that I am the Lord. No longer will the people of Israel have malicious neighbors who are painful briars and sharp thorns. Then they will know that I am the Lord, the Sovereign Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. When I gather people of Israel from the nations where they've been scattered, I'll be proved holy through them in the sight of the nations. Proved holy through them in the sight of the people groups. Then they will live in their own land which I gave to my servant Jacob. They will live there in safety and will build houses and plant vineyards. They will live in safety when I inflict punishment on all their neighbors who malign them. Then they will know that I am the Lord their God. Fitting a little bit. People have asked the question, why Sidon? There's no accusation against them. Sidon kind of took over when Tyre and the leader was forced to kind of submit to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar never took the island state of Tyre, but they had to cooperate and they paid tribute to Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire. Sidon kind of took over, continued on the same kind of rebellious attitude. But you see, there's a goal running behind this. God wants to display his glory for all to see, and he wants to display his holiness for all to see, and these are essentially the same. And within you am proved to be holy. That's what he's saying. <clears throat> Now he does that through his people, in this case the people of Judah. When his people live in obedience, they will enjoy security. Their lifestyle will reflect something of the quality that God wishes, that brings life to its full and its best. God's glory is seen in his people. God's holiness is seen in his people and is shown to the people groups round about. It involves two things. We don't like that word. We do like that one. The trouble is that the word punishment has multiple meanings in English, and indeed there are multiple words in the original languages of the Bible. So be very careful. Whenever you see the word punishment, just watch. What is the original author really meaning? What is the original word actually conveying? <clears throat> carry this idea in mind. It's helpful. Punishment very often in the Bible is related to God putting things right. When we do not display his glory for all to see, when we do not display his holiness, God comes to put things right in us. He's seeking our obedience, our response. He is seeking to rescue us, and in a sense, punishment and rescue are related to each other. There are deep, deep thoughts in God's purposes through his people. God wants to work through his people, through our life quality, to reveal himself, his glory and his holiness to wider societies all around. Now, bringing back the last bit, the latter bit of this, and fading out the earlier bit, Two phrases that look rather similar. Then they, that's the malicious neighbours, will know that I am the Sovereign Lord. And in the red, then they will know, that's the people of Judah, the people of God, that I am the Lord, their God. You see, the enemies of God's people will see that God is with his people at all times. The people of Judah did survive through as an entity. The other people groups faded out and disappeared from history. But God's people will understand at a much deeper level that God is their God and is with them at all times. The little word the. 
Other people groups, yes, see God, but God at a distance. God's people see God as their God. God is with them. And God wants to demonstrate his life quality and his holiness through us to bless the other people groups and draw him to God. That's God's purposes then and now. It has never changed. Watch that word punishment again. The word there carries the idea of like a decision of a judge. These people groups had caused so much problem God had decided to do something about it. This section is the key. And we summarize it that way. God is only seen, God wants to be seen in the lives of his people, in this case the people of Judah, today the followers of Jesus. But he's only going to be seen in us when we're following his directions, when we're living his life quality. We enjoy the security he brings us in modern terms through the finished work of Jesus, his life, death and resurrection. But the fulfillment of that is in our life quality. Or we need to ask searching questions. What do other people see in God's people, the followers of Jesus today? in the West. God is sovereign, but God only intervenes in human history in line with that purpose. He wants himself to be shown in the lives of his people. And that can only happen when we live lives following the Maker's instructions, when we enjoy his security, when our lives show the quality living that reflects the perfect quality living of Jesus. Challenges for us today. Now we're going now to move on to Egypt and use Egypt as a kind of example of empires and what happens to them. There's a whole series of prophetic insights given here. Pharaoh describes the crocodile of the Nile, hardly complimentary. Egypt described as Nebuchadnezzar's consolation prize. It's God that's doing it. The strength and the arms of Pharaoh, if you have no arms, you can't wield weapons. The line of Pharaohs was doomed, as indeed it was. The pharaonic monster was going to go. And then a picture here, descent into Sheol. We'll look at that word in a moment or two. Now, not all, but many of the sections are dated precisely, but the dates are not in order. Now, this suggests that a whole series, maybe seven prophetic insights given over a period of time, have been brought together in illogical rather than chronological order. They're telling a story. And in general, they're saying the same thing at different points in history. A kind of sequence of ideas. Let's just look at the place of Egypt in the context of the people of God. There were slavery in Egypt and they were released. If we look at Egyptian records, and they kept good records, like some of the people groups round about, campaigns against Israel. By the 10th century, Solomon married an Egyptian princess amongst numerous other wives going against God's commands. Five years after his death Pharaoh Shishak invaded Judah and he stole some of the temple artifacts. Big change in Egypt were taken over by an Ethiopian dynasty and they took on a policy of resisting Assyria and Isaiah spoke at that time against any alliance with Egypt in the end, Assyria just overran Egypt. But they regained their independence. But Necho II, a pharaoh, decided to support Assyria against the Babylonians. Changed sides. King Josiah of Judah, a good king, foolishly decided to resist Egypt. And he lost his life in battle. And it was a tragedy 
for the people of Judah, for he was a good king. Pharaoh put a puppet king on the throne, Jehoiakim. Various battles, but the Egyptian army was destroyed by the Babylonians. They retreated back to their land, but they continually tried to influence King Zedekiah, a weak, vacillating king of Judah, encouraging resistance to Nebuchadnezzar, and that was the downfall in the end of Zedekiah. The Babylonians come and wipe out Pharaoh's army and the Babylonians overrun Egypt. And after the Babylonian era, Egypt as an empire just fades into obscurity. It's no longer a world power and never has been since. That's just an overview of what happened in history. In the tenth year, in the tenth month, on the twelfth day, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, set your face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against him and against all Egypt. Speak to him and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Now that's dated as 7th January 587 BC. About the time Jerusalem was going to be besieged. Pharaoh Hophra has been referred to here. Opportunistic, ambitious, but he was encouraging the rebellion against Nebuchadnezzar, which eventually led to Nebuchadnezzar destroying Judah. I'm against you, Pharaoh king of Egypt, you great monster lying among your streams. You say the Nile belongs to me. I made it for myself. But I will put hooks in your jaws and make the fish of your streams stick to your scales. I will pull you out from among your streams with all the fish sticking to your scales. He's pictured here as a crocodile who'll be caught. The Egyptian people, the fish, will come with him. They're left stranded in the desert. Vivid poetic picture. I will leave you in the desert, you and all the fish of your streams. You will fall in the open field and not be gathered or picked up. I will give you as food to the beasts of the earth and the birds of the sky. Then all who live in Egypt will know that I am the Lord. Empire was overrun. You have been a staff of reed for the people of Israel. When they grasped you with their hands, you splintered and you tore open their shoulders. When they leaned on you, you broke and their backs were wrenched. Totally lacking dependability. Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. I'll bring a sword against you and kill both man and beast. Egypt will become a desolate wasteland. Then they will know that I am the Lord. And campaigns by the Babylon Empire against Egypt did immense damage. That was the tragedy. The prophets declared the mind of God and the leadership refused to listen. Because you said the Nile is mine, I made it. Therefore I am against you and against your streams. I'll make the land of Egypt a ruin and a desolate waste from Migdot Aswan, as far as the borders of Cush. The foot of neither man nor beast will pass through it. No one will live there for forty years. That's a generation. I'll make the land of Egypt desolate among devastated lands, and her cities will lie desolate for forty years among ruined cities. And I will disperse the Egyptians among the nations and scatter them throughout the countries. It often seen itself as powerful, as going back to its old days of empire. In the end of the day, it will be overrun, and it was overrun. And the nation as an empire was destroyed. And the devastation lasted a generation in the land. Yet this is what the Sovereign Lord says, At the end of forty years, at the end of that generation, I will gather Egyptians from the nations where they were scattered. I bring them back from captivity and return them to Upper Egypt, the land of their ancestry. Then there there will be a lowly kingdom. But the lowliest of the kingdoms will never again exalt itself among above other nations. I'll make it so weak that it will never again rule over the nations. Egypt will no longer be a source of confidence for the people of Israel, but a reminder of their sin in turning to her for help. Then they will know that I am the Sovereign Lord. History shows that all happened. It would restart after a generation. It would resume its nationhood. But 
it would never again be a great power or an empire. The people of Judah foolishly again and again, ignoring the prophets, had looked to Egypt for help against the power of the Assyrian and Babylonian empires. It didn't work. The people of Judah should have depended on God, not the empire of Egypt, which was a fading empire with its own agendas. And it had no real interest in helping anybody unless it brought Egypt itself some benefit. Moving on. The twenty seventh year in the first month of the first on the first day the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, drove his army in a hard campaign against Tyre. Every head was rubbed bare and every shoulder made raw. Yet he and his army got no reward from the campaign he led against Tyre. It was a thirteen year war of attrition. They never took the island state of Tyre. The leader had to capitulate and give pay pay payments to Nebuchadnezzar each year. But the soldiers didn't get their rewards of the booty. Therefore this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I'm going to give Egypt to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Ab Babylon. He will carry off its wealth. He will loot and plunder the land as pay for his army. I will give him Egypt as a reward for his efforts because he and his army did it for me, declares the Sovereign Lord. On that day I will make a horn grow for the Israelites, and I will open your mouth among them, then they will know that I am the Lord. The people of God would start to come alive and waken up to what was happening and what God was saying. And Ezekiel himself would be able to speak openly and completely. That's dated much later. Now let's look at history and see how it fits together. We looked at chapter 26, which predicted the fall of Tyre. That's what happened. Tyre ruled the whole area round about. Nebuchadnezzar blitzed it. But the ruler of Tyre had to accept Babylonian authority. His wings were clipped totally. And it was destroyed later completely at the hands of Alexander the Great and disappeared from history. But after that tough campaign, Nebuchadnezzar and his army enjoyed easier pickings when they took on Egypt. Should have been the other way around. Egypt was an empire. The soldiers got their rewards of the booty then. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy and say, This is what the sovereign Lord says. Wail and say, Alas for that day. For the day is near, the day of the Lord is near, a day of clouds, a, day, a time of doom for the nations. A sword will come against Egypt, and anguish will come upon Cush when the slain fall in Egypt. Her wealth will be carried away, and her foundations torn away. Now let's remember Ezekiel is speaking to the exiles, the drawn from their former leadership classes of Judah. They were still looking for Egyptian help to rescue Jerusalem. The penny hadn't dropped. And Ezekiel's aim in all this is to undermine any residual faith these people had in Egypt. The empire of Egypt was spent. It was finished. It was going to be wiped out. It would recover, but only as a weak nation. Watch that phrase, the day of the Lord. If you track it through the whole of the Bible, the phrase simply means a time when God intervenes in the affairs of humans. Egypt had resisted God, thumbed its nose at God, ignored God, pursued selfish agendas for generations and centuries. It was just a great power broker, seeking power for itself, and it exploited its own people and people it conquered for its own benefit and gain. God was going to intervene to bring that to an end. The empire was going simply to be destroyed. You'd be left with a small, weak nation. Ezekiel 
That's the message, and it's a message that runs through all these prophetic sayings about Egypt. History shows it was true. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I'll put an end to the hordes of Egypt by the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He and his army, the most ruthless of nations, will be brought in to destroy the land. They will draw their swords against Egypt and fill the land with the slain. I will destroy the idols and put an end to the images in Memphis. No longer will there be a prince in Egypt, and I will spread fear throughout the land. I will lay waste upper Egypt, set fire to Zoan, and inflict punishment on Thebes. So I will inflict punishment in Egypt, and they will know that I am the Lord. The army swept through, pillaged, destroyed, and looted. Watch the word punishment. The decision of God is judge. Egypt was facing the consequences for its persistent actions. In the eleventh year, in the first month of the seventh day, on the seventh day the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, I have broken the arm of Pharaoh king of Egypt. It has not been bound up to be healed or put in a splint so it may become strong enough to hold a sword. Therefore this is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against Pharaoh king of Egypt. I will break both his arms, the good arm as well as the broken one. I make the sword fall from his hands. Metaphor, if you've got broken arms, you can't wield weapons. I will disperse the Egyptians among the nations, scatter them throughout the countries. That happened under the Nebuchadnezzar rule. I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon and put my sword in his hand, but I will break the arms of Pharaoh and he will groan before him like a mortally wounded man. I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon, but the arms of Pharaoh will fall limp. Then they will know that I am the Lord when I put my sword into the hand of the king of Babylon and he brandishes it against Egypt. I will disperse the Egyptians among the nations and scatter them throughout the countries. Then they will know that I am the Lord. That's what happened. 587 Siege was underway in Jerusalem. That's what Jeremiah records, and that's probably the context. Nebuchadnezzar was besieging Jerusalem. Pharaoh's army marched out of Egypt, and when the Babylonians who had besieged were besieging Jerusalem heard the report about them, they withdrew from Jerusalem. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Tell the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of me. Pharaoh's army, which has marched out to support you, will go back to its own land, to Egypt. Then the Babylonians will return and attack the city. They will capture it and burn it down. This is what the Lord says. Do not deceive yourselves thinking the Babylonians will surely leave us. They will not. Even if you were to defeat the entire Babylonian army that is attacking you and only wounded men were left in their tents, they would come out and burn the city down. Jeremiah was speaking in Jerusalem, saying, This reprieve is temporary. The Babylonians will be back. The city will fall. Ezekiel was saying to the exiles in the Babylon area, the Babylonians will defeat the Egyptians. The Egyptians will not rescue you. Don't look to the Egyptians for help. There's a deep message for us today. That was true then and it's still true today. If you think about it, in secular thinking, those with greatest power, resources and weaponry will win. At the ultimate level, the spiritual realm, that's not true. God's still in control. Pharaoh Hophra, which was the Pharaoh at the time, he saw himself as a kind of manifestation of the divine. How many rulers and despotic regimes, even in the world today, see themselves as close to divine? They are beyond contradiction. He stood against Yahweh, the Lord of the universe. The Babylonians brought him and his nation down. And you look out in the world today and, and there are despotic rulers doing horrendous things. And we think we can't win. We think we're weak. We think we're hopeless. And we, the people of God, we don't know what to do. 
We need to get together and recognize that when we bring ourselves into line with the will of God, when we're prepared to listen to him again, do it his way, great power, resources and weaponry counts for nothing in God's eyes. The great empires of the world will not win. God will take us through. In the eleventh year, third month of the first day, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, say to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to his hordes, who can be compared with you in majesty? The cedars in the garden of God could not rival it, nor could the junipers equal its boughs, nor could the plane trees compare with its branches. No tree in the garden of God could match its beauty. I made it beautiful, with abundant branches, the envy of all the trees of Eden in the garden of God. A little bit later that year, Egypt thought it was wonderful. Remember again the word Eden. There's no capital letter in the original. Not a specific place, it's just a place of vast wealth and opulence. And the garden of God is just a metaphor for a utopian situation of prosperity and joy. The Egyptians thought they had it all. Wealth, power and armaments. That's what they depended on. Therefore this was Sovereign Lord says, because the great cedar towered over the thick foliage and because it was proud of its height, I gave it into the hands of the ruler of the nations for him to deal with according to his wickedness. The arrogance of depending on these physical things, I cast it aside and the most ruthless of foreign nations cut it down and left it. Egypt was going to be destroyed by the Babylonians. Which of the trees of Eden <coughs> can be compared with you in splendor and majesty? Yet you too will be brought down with the trees of Eden to the earth below. You lie among the uncircumcised with those killed by the sword. This is Pharaoh and all his whores, declares the Sovereign Lord. Now in this chapter, there's a hidden comparison. The glorious and apparently invincible empire of Assyria came crashing down in 612 BC. Nineveh, its capital, was taken and disappeared from history. It literally disappeared under the desert to be discovered years later by archaeologists. Exactly the same would happen to Egypt. That great empire would disappear totally from history as an empire just become a small people group. That's what happens to empires when they pile up their reputation, thumb their nose at God and depend on armaments and power and wealth for their success. When they abuse other people and take over other people, invade other countries without due regard for the suffering of the people. And we look out in the world today, it's happening today before our eyes. These great empires, with all their power, will come crashing down and God will flick them into the dust of history. And their leaders will be nothing. To the final chapter. <clears throat> 585 BC. Jerusalem has fallen. In the twelfth year, in the twelfth month, on the first day, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, take up a lament concerning Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and say to him, You are like a lion among the nations. You are like a monster in the seas, thrashing about in your streams, churning the water with your feet and muddying the streams. This is what the sovereign Lord says. With a great throng of people, I will cast my net over you, and they will haul you up in my net. When I snuff you out, I will cover the heavens and darken their stars. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon will not give its light. All the shining lights in the heavens, I will darken over you. I will bring darkness over your land, declares the Sovereign Lord. I will trouble the hearts of many peoples when I bring about your destruction among the nations. This is poetry, not literalism. Vivid poetry. 
Jerusalem had fallen two months later. It took them quite a while for news to reach the exiles in Babylon, but two months later, this picture of Egypt. And perhaps the exiles in Babylon were still seeing the hope of rescue coming from Egypt. And Ezekiel was thumping away, no, there is no future in depending on Egypt. And the downfall of Egypt will almost have a cosmic impact on the people who goes round about. It was one of the major empires of the era and had been there a long time. Ezekiel goes on, for this is what the Sovereign Lord says, The sword of the king of Babylon will come against you, and I will cause your hordes to fall. By the swords of mighty men, the most ruthless of all nations, it will shatter the pride of Egypt, and all our hordes will be overthrown when I make Egypt desolate and strip the land of everything in it. When I strike down all who live there, then they will know that I am the Lord. That's what happened to Egypt. And that's what happens to world empires. Look through the history books and you will see it. Assyria came with infinite power and skill. It went. Babylon came with its ruthlessness and its violence and its efficiency. It disappeared from history. Egypt, a power broker for centuries, millennia disappeared from history as a world power and you can go on down through the history of humanity to see the same thing happening again and again when people set up empires and abuse others and other nations and other people groups with their power their weapons and their violence God eventually brings them down they disappear from history and into the last section, in the twelfth year, in the fifteenth day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, wail for the hordes of Egypt, and consign to the earth below, both her and the daughters of mighty nations, along with those who go down to the pit, say to them, Are you more favoured than others? Go down and be laid among the uncircumcised, they will fall among those killed by the sword. Assyria is there with her whole army. She, she is surrounded by the graves of all her slain, all have fallen by the sword. Their graves are in the depths of the pit, and our army lies around her grave. All who spit terror in the land of the living are slain, fallen by the sword. Elam is there, another northern nation. Meshach and Tubal are there, another northern nation. People groups had empire power, with all their hordes around their graves. Edom is there, from the south. All the princes of the north and all the Sidonians are there. Power and wealth of trade. Pharaoh, he and all his army will see them, and he will be consoled for all his whores that were killed by the sword, declares the Sovereign Lord. Though I allowed him to spread terror in the land of the living, Pharaoh and all his whores will be laid among the uncircumcised, with those killed by the sword, declares the Sovereign Lord. Now we have to interpret this in the context of key words, as they were understood then. Jerusalem has fallen. The whole world, the whole known world around the area was in complete anarchy. Babylonians had taken over everything. But in due time the Babylonians would also fall. That's a picture of how Assyria behaved. But it's also a picture of all other brutal empires down through history. Think what Putin is doing in Ukraine today. Another modern example of precisely this brutal empires making people suffer. He will be brought down. His empire will disappear. And remember uncircumcised is just a metaphorical term. Circumcision was practiced amongst many people groups at that time. When they get beyond the grave, they're going to be outside the community of God, whoever their God may be, rejected. It often meant that. You couldn't get into the family grave. And in the netherworld, life after death as they saw it, you don't get a good position. Let's just pursue that a little bit further talked about key words, words that relate to death. I've put them up, transliterated. 
occurs twice in this passage, but is very common in the Old Testament. The word actually means a shadowy place of the dead. Now, tragically, sadly, it's mistranslated in the older translations as hell. The people of the Old Testament era in the people of God and the people groups round about had no concept of hell whatsoever. They didn't even have a word for it as we understand the word today. Sheol does not mean hell. It means a shadowy place of the dead. Very commonly in this passage there's a word translated pit. Now that could be a literal hole in the ground but in the passage here as it often is it's a metaphorical word describing death. The grave could be the physical grave, literally, but more often it's metaphorical for death. These are words that occur frequently in this chapter, and indeed they're words that are widely used in the Old Testament, and they reflect the way things were understood at the time. You see, people at that time, including the people of God, saw heaven as the realm of deity. The idea of us going to heaven... That whole revelation came with what Jesus did for us in his life, death and resurrection. And he gave us that teaching and he showed us the model with his resurrection. But they didn't have it at that time. Earth was just a place for the ordinary people living. But Sheol was a shadowy place of the dead, the realm of the dead. And this is how they saw it. like a communal cemetery and they saw it with kind of compartments where people were allocated by a kind of class the soul that's the you that makes you you that lived on it was fully conscious God ruled in hell and any concept of punishment they had it resembled regret people would regret that they were not in the top compartments in the shadowy place of the dead. Now that's what the word means. And there is in fact a word in the Greek that carries the same idea in the New Testament. We have misunderstood the nature of hell considerably. But that's how they saw it then. Let's bring it together. True then, it's true today. And when you look at the weapons and the arms industry built up by the West, and then very often exported for money to quite unsavoury regimes overseas, we think the same way. Live for power, brute force, forcing people around, exploiting others, treating others badly, such empires will be brought down. In the end of the day, we all go to death. Comes equally to all, and with certainty. Nobody can avoid it. We take nothing away with us. Our power, our possessions, our reputations, our status, they're all lost when we move out of this life and pass through death. Counts for nothing. But God stands against those who brutalize others for their own aggrandizement. The empires of the past, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, and so on, that's the way they went. The empires of today, brutalizing others for their own aggrandizement, the suffering of people groups in China, the suffering of God's people in North Korea. Brutalized by dictatorial leaders. The suffering of people in Eastern Europe under the hand of communism of the past. It came down. And a kind of way it's resurrected under Putin. But it will come down. The suffering of people in Western Europe under Hitler. It came down. In the end, God puts things right. Hang on to that. 
There are times when we almost feel like despairing looking out in the world. In the end, God puts things right. We have to seek his ways, seek his will, listen to him. We've got to put our house in order as God's people, yes. But hang on to that great truth that this section has shown to us. God comes to put things right. And that's a great message that Ezekiel was bringing to these confused exile leaders. And after that hard stretch, I'm going to move on next presentation and look back at Ezekiel and what God was saying to him as a person as his role changed with the fall of Jerusalem. And he starts to unravel God's purposes for the people of God.